Hi, I'm Kelly Giordano with Newman's Own Foundation. In 1982, Paul Newman and his friend A.E. Hotchner had a single great salad dressing and a single great idea, that 100% of any profits made from Newman's Own products would be given away. Since 1982, Newman's Own Foundation has done just that, donating more than half a billion dollars to worthy charities around the globe. And Paul was an avid supporter of public television. He believed in the power of public television to inform, inspire, and build stronger communities. And now, we're excited to announce a special Newman's Own Foundation challenge just for NJTV. Through the entire month of March, Newman's Own Foundation will match your contribution dollar for dollar up to $25,000. So call or go online right now and we can double your donation. Any contribution, large or small, will help NJTV meet this challenge. Together we can support the essential and inspiring programming on New Jersey Public Television. Thank you. Major funding for NJTV News is provided in part by the members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. Independent College Fund of New Jersey, in partnership with McCarter and English, providing legal strategies to help drive our clients' businesses forward for 175 years. And PSE and G, we make things work for communities. Tonight on NJTV News, a new attitude to tackle budget talks on taxes and spending. Is there a new relationship between Democratic legislative leaders and Governor Murphy? They were awfully kind to him yesterday, even as they rejected his call for a millionaire's tax. The governor's promised no new fare hikes for NJ Transit, and the agency's executive director says he'll make that work one way or another. Dementia and Down Syndrome, we begin our four-part series, Aging and the Unknown, Adults with Developmental Disabilities. Plus, this first Wednesday of Lent, the faithful are finding new ways to observe an ancient ritual, getting ashes to go. Those stories and more next on NJTV News. from the Agnes Barris NJTV studio at 2 Gateway Center in Newark. This is NJTV News with Mary Alice Williams. Hello, thank you for joining us on air and online. More money for transit and schools, higher taxes on millionaires. The governor's second budget does contain some contentious carryovers from the first, but with an important difference. Chief political correspondent Michael Aaron reports. Governor Murphy said today he's going to fight for the millionaire's tax, despite opposition from the Senate president and the assembly speaker. I personally believe we're talking about 19,000 people who at the federal level have gotten a very good shake. Uh, they got a good shake uh, during the prior administration in New Jersey. Um, it's not a big number but it's a huge game changer in our ability to invest in the middle class. At the same time, he acknowledged that the atmosphere surrounding him and the leaders has improved. We did lay this out with both sides of the aisle before we went public with this budget yesterday. Um, I had a good breakfast uh, with a good spirit with the Senate president and the assembly speaker yesterday, just the, the three of us. Um, you know, we're able, you know, we're not going to agree on everything, but we've been able to find common ground on a lot of stuff. In his budget address yesterday, Murphy showed deference to the legislative process. I understand the budget I am proposing today will not be identical to the one that I will ultimately sign. We will talk, we will negotiate, and we will compromise. This is as it should be. This is how our system works best. The leaders reciprocated. The governor gets deserves credit for having understood what it, having gone through the process now for a year, understanding the legislature and the legislature's uh, needs. The budget he has presented to us today is not the budget he expects to sign, and we ex we appreciate him recognizing that because what I took from that is he's looking for compromise. I think we're all looking for compromise at the end of the day. So this is a very good first step in my mind. What a difference a year makes. This is what they were saying last year. The governor offered no compromise, offered no counterproposal. He rejected it out of hand. He likes to talk about Christie, and I think he studied him very well. And his behavior is exactly like Chris Christie's, but he smiles more. 
the new tone is welcomed. One thing became uh, very, very clear yesterday, and that is the uh, contrariness that oftentimes has typified the relationship between uh, legislative leadership and executive leadership is something that all of us would wish to be part of the past and not part of the future. Well, I think last year the governor introduced the, the governor introduced a budget and said, this is his budget, can you please pass it? This year he's acknowledging that there's going to be some give and take. He also acknowledged some legislative priorities in this budget, things that were important to various legislators and their, and their constituencies, um, and he left them in the budget, so we're not negotiating them in or out. Senate President Sweeney told us today we're partners, the governor, the speaker, and I. The governor brought a new attitude to the table, and we appreciate it. They'll still clash over the millionaire's tax proposal, but this year the governor, the Senate president, and the assembly speaker seem to be working in an entirely different atmosphere. In Woodridge, I'm Michael Aaron, NJTV News. Late word from the State House: Senate Republicans have delivered a letter to the governor and Democratic leadership calling for a commitment to passing structural reforms as an alternative to raising taxes. Now to the chronically problem-plagued NJ Transit. The governor's plan does add millions of dollars to get the commuter line back on track, but politics could still derail it. Here's senior correspondent Brenda Flanagan. Absolutely, under no circumstance, can New Jersey transit riders face another fare hike. Transportation advocate Janet Chernett spoke emphatically for every commuter frustrated by months of canceled NJ Transit trains, dozens of them just this past Monday, as Governor Murphy and the legislature start negotiating a new state budget. Murphy's also anxious to avoid fare increases and today repeated the guarded promise from his proposed spending plan, which offered a $100 million funding boost for the agency. If we can get this increase of investment uh, in NJ Transit, it, and we'll know that in the next couple of months, there will be no fare increase for another fiscal year. That's a big deal. There wasn't a fare increase this year. Which begs the question, what happens if budget talks get derailed over the governor's proposed millionaire's tax or other revenue disputes? Could that possibly end in a transit fare hike, good intentions notwithstanding? NJ Transit's executive director today said probably not. Yeah, I don't see a scenario for that, uh, for raising the fares. Anyway, the budget uh, year, fiscal year starts July 1, so uh, I think if you look at the bigger numbers, I, I don't see that being something we couldn't work around if, if for some reason this didn't go through. While our fare box collections are very good at 50 percent, we cannot be successful without the support from the general fund. NJ Transit needs state funding for its day-to-day -day operations and has survived only by cannibalizing its capital funds. The governor's proposed budget allots more than $400 million for the agency. That's $100 million more than this fiscal year. The increase includes $25 million in new money and another $75 million to replace funds diverted from other sources. But that wasn't enough for Senate Democrats. We think New Jersey Transit needs to be funded better than what they're, that they have in this budget. I, uh, I don't have much transit where I live, but I agree with the senator that we need to do better. We're wide open to more investment in transportation and NJ Transit specifically, but we have to at the same time uh, acknowledge that there are the, what, what, what priorities uh, are we uh, uh, making, and secondly, where are the sustainable sources of revenue that are going to support that? NJ Transit spent eight years on a starvation budget under former Governor Christie. It's now training 17 new engineers to help fill a gaping personnel deficit, one reason so many trains get canceled. And last year, it managed to get just enough positive train control equipment installed to meet federal deadlines, but only by taking cars, locomotives, and entire lines like the Atlantic City Railway out of service. The AC line scheduled to reopen May 24th, and South Jersey Assemblyman Vince Mack ASIO wants a big slice of compensation in the new budget, stating, I will fight to ensure some of that investment goes toward the AC rail line once it's reopened and the citizens of Atlantic County, who have suffered without the train for the better part of a year. This budget process could get as cranky as a rush hour with canceled trains and stranded riders. A fare hike to, to fill budget gaps, that is avoidable. There needs to be a stable source of revenue, revenue, and it cannot be on the backs of riders. Of course, budget negotiations could still go off the rails. They did last year, but any fare increase would definitely touch the third rail. In Wood Ridge, I'm Brenda Flanagan, NJTV News.
But it's the millionaire's tax that has the attention of New Jersey's business sector. Rhonda Schaffler's here with that and more. Rhonda? Mary Alice, Governor Murphy's proposed millionaire's tax isn't sitting well with New Jersey's business community. That's because it would particularly impact small business owners due to the tax structure under which they operate. Chamber of Commerce President Tom Bracken, who's an NJTV trustee, says that tax would make the state less competitive. We have uh, people who, over the last year, have been taxed with corporate business taxes, with mandates, which is a form of a tax. Uh, and the business community has had it with uh, the, uh, cost, uh, um, the costs that have been thrown on them over the last year. The millionaire's tax is sort of the last straw. Business groups like many lawmakers are pushing for additional cost-cutting in the budget. Another proposed tax on businesses in this budget is what the governor is calling a corporate responsibility fee that would require larger businesses to pay a $150 fee for each employee covered by Medicaid. The administration says the fee is designed to encourage employers to provide more meaningful health benefits and reduce reliance on government programs. It would generate around $30 million for the state. The governor also provided some insight into how he'd like to replace the Economic Development Authority's Grow NJ Business Incentive Program, which has come under criticism. A recent audit of that program found a lack of accountability for the $11 billion in incentives awarded to businesses over the years. The governor wants to scrap the program entirely and replace it with something called NJ Forward. His budget also included a few other incentive programs, which would all be capped in total at $400 million a year. In other news, ADP based in Roseland released its monthly report on private sector hiring across the country. ADP says 183,000 new jobs were created in February. That is a slower pace than the last two months, with the retail and travel industries scaling back. In other news, the U.S. trade deficit increased to a 10-year high. That impacted Wall Street today. The Dow lost 133 points. And those are your top business stories. The former Murphy staffer accused of rape has been ordered to testify next Tuesday. Al Alvarez has been subpoenaed by the committee investigating the allegation that's roiled the Murphy administration, how that was handled. Alvarez has consistently denied the charges, but questions remain about how he got his job with the school's development authority even after Katie Brennan had informed higher-ups of the alleged sexual assault. New Jersey's joining other multi -state, another multi-state lawsuit against the Trump administration, this one to block new federal regulations that would effectively strip federal funding from health care providers that perform abortions and give abortion referrals. New Jersey's 47 clinics that received Title X funding, some $9 million in the last fiscal year, would no longer be able to perform abortions in the same space where they see other patients. The governor calls the attempt to limit health care and family planning services for low-income people reckless and unacceptable. Today is Ash Wednesday, when many Christians receive a cross of ashes on their foreheads to mark the start of the season of Lent leading up to Easter Sunday. It's an ancient ritual that's been given a modern update, Leah Mishkin reports. We can't any longer sit and wait for people to come to churches. Churches have to go to people. Parishioner Bruce Lovejoy is letting cars and people walking by know that Trinity Episcopal Church in Morristown is offering ashes to go. Right this way, right this way. Beginning of Lent, Ash Wednesday. Ashes to go is an effort to get church leaders into the community on Ash Wednesday to administer ashes to people who can't get to church, whether that's in train stations, on the streets, or in the parking lot. You know, it was a new concept because being an Episcopalian all my life, I knew to get ashes on Ash Wednesday, but in a closed structure. I definitely think that it, it helps um, uh, working parents, it helps busy people, and um, it's a great way to um, kind of reflect on the day. Kristen, remember that you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Ash Wednesday marks the beginning of Lent, the period set aside to prepare for Easter. We remember that Jesus spent 40 days in the wilderness uh, fasting, and so we imitate Jesus um, by 
often giving something up. The Reverend Emily Malott was called to Trinity Episcopal Church after leading the Ashes to Go movement in Chicago. We fail and we need to start over again. Um, to be able to do that right in the middle of your daily life is very important. Why did you decide to partake in Ashes to Go? Well, we know we have a number of businesses that are right around here and that not everybody can come for the entire liturgy. So I say the prayer for today and then give them ashes and then I wish them a holy Lent. Bishop Carly Hughes administered ashes at the entrance of Trinity and St. Philip's Cathedral in Newark. They're a symbol of our mortality. They're a symbol of our brokenness and a reminder because they're in the shape of a cross that all can be re -heal healed and all can be redeemed. In that time, they get to step into that kind of divine sacred space. This Rutgers professor stopped on his way to class. And Ash Wednesday is not really a holiday for anybody, so it's, uh, you kind of have to you can do it where you, when you can, I guess. Kathleen Walsh didn't think she would be able to do this because of work, but then she saw this sign. 14 years of Catholic okay. school, so this is really important. An old custom with a new twist. Leia Mishkin, NJTV News. More and more people with developmental disabilities are being cared for at home rather than in institutions. Statistics show they're living longer with conditions that can often change as they age, launching them and their caregivers into uncharted territory. Tonight, we begin a four-part series reported by Brianna Venosi on aging and the unknown adults with developmental disabilities. Let's do blue, Craigie. Luke? Most days, Craig Cambies doesn't talk a whole lot. In fact, words continue to escape the 59-year-old Down syndrome man. Memories do, too. It's part of the daily struggle for his sister and sole caretaker, Adele Barlow, making sure they share meaningful moments, even as Craig becomes a stranger to the present. Do you remember what this is? Oh, yeah. What's this? Do you remember what that is? Behind his striking blue eyes and sweet disposition, Craig is battling dementia, like so many other Down syndrome adults across the state, whose early days developed slowly. Now the end seems to be rushing at them. It was actually about a year ago when he started, uh, he didn't remember our names. He was once a New Jersey Devils hockey fanatic competitive swimmer, equestrian, and gold medal winner in the Special Olympics. Today, Craig has no interest in those activities, and the skills his family fought so hard to help him master are slowly slipping away. He could communicate before, uh, say two years ago. Um, I could give him instructions, and he would pretty much follow them. And he had his routine, and uh, he could dress himself and feed himself, and. Uh, change the TV channels, and he can't do any of that anymore. And I would say it's all occurred within the past year to year and a half um, where I dress him and I, I physically brush his teeth for him and I shave him. This is the first generation of people with Down syndrome who have been out in the community and kept with their families. A lot of people think that most people live in group homes. Not true. Leon Murphy is considered an expert in this community. She helped open the first health clinic for developmentally disabled adults at the nonprofit Monmouth Ark. She's a nurse practitioner, and her 45-year-old Down syndrome daughter, Michelle, is part of a first generation whose parents defy doctor's orders to institutionalize babies born with Downs and now face a relatively unknown world of aging with the disability. Before, they were usually put in developmental centers, and they died much younger. We, they didn't have the medical care that we have now, the antibiotics, the preventative health. During the mid-60s, the average life expectancy for a person born with Down syndrome was about 21 years. 
Today, that number has tripled, according to the Association for Down Syndrome, with many living well beyond. But so too has the prevalence of dementia. Research from the NIH show up to 55 percent of Down syndrome adults ages 40 to 49 years old will be clinically diagnosed. That number increases as they age. And the reason there's such a high correlation of the dementia in this population is the plaque, the, the amyloid plaque that causes dementia is on the 21st chromosome in all of us. So you and I have two chromosomes, but they have three. So that's why it starts so early with them. What has not been understood is what happens to those who age with Down syndrome. But Jane Boyle lived it. Her sister Ellen thrived as a cherished member of their Seagirt community until she died from Alzheimer's disease at age 52. Ellen played sports, volunteered, held a job, and kept a jam-packed social calendar. It was like molasses, her, the, you know, whatever the internal processor in her brain was. So one by one, all these wonderful activities just sort of fell away. We met Jane Boyle, Leon Murphy, and Adele Barlow at the first ever statewide support group meeting for caretakers of those with Down syndrome and dementia. Hi, how are you? Very I spoke good. to your mother. Yes. I'm so happy yeah. to meet you. Nice to meet you as well. Boyle and Murphy, whose sister and daughter were best friends, created the group hoping to share what they've learned. With few doctors specializing in this middle-aged population, they are, as they did all those years ago, relying on their own instincts. Boyle helped write the first and only national handbook on the topic. Because both the minds and bodies of adults with Down syndrome age at a quicker rate, families are often unaware of the signs. They told me that most likely you were going to be faced with really difficult decisions and it will probably come on very quickly and very rapidly. They said probably within the next five years you will start seeing changes in her. Unfortunately, some of the families that I worked with, they thought the behaviors they were seeing were being difficult, being stubborn. Uh, obstinate. Now she knows how to get dressed. Why isn't she getting herself dressed? Putting their clothes on over their pajamas, um, not being able to do a lot of the tasks like take a shower by themselves, brush their hair, those kinds of things. But really it was the dementia. If you know any family who has developmental disability in their family, it's what they think about all the time. Understanding how to help these families is Paul Aronson's role as the newly created state ombudsman for individuals with intellectual or developmental disabilities. I figured that I've connected with in the first eight and a half months about 150 families and that's you know those are families with children, those are families with adult children, those are families you know trying to deal with a whole sort of slew of issues uh, from housing and employment to transportation. With few public resources available, Aronson says families fear for the future. And unlike most parents, those with developmentally disabled children actually pray to outlive their own. The focus has been on the younger people who are coming out of high school and transitioning into society and living independently. And that's great because that wasn't available when Craig got out of high school all important but now we have this whole new generation or whatever that's aging and didn't happen before um, down syndrome people didn't live as long as they're living now so maybe this is new but um, even the, the medical profession even now is it's unhelpful um, I feel like I'm very much on my own to figure out what's going on read what I can what is this one your metal. Still, Barlow is hoping to find the brighter side of a dark diagnosis. And in these fleeting moments, when the light shines through Craig's eyes, Barlow knows she can't stop the dementia from stealing her brother's memories. But she's determined to make each one count. Tomorrow, in part two, we explore mainstreaming medicine. For NJTV News, I'm Brianna Venosi.
now some noteworthy facts that help you know Jersey. The governor's proposed billionaire's tax would affect some 18,000 New Jersey residents. Murphy's proposed budget would provide $25 million in new funding for NJ Transit. 47 facilities in New Jersey receive funds from the Title X Family Planning Program. And Thomas Edison was a founding member of the New Jersey Chamber of Commerce in 1911. If there's someone you'd like to get to know Jersey, share. Use hashtag no Jersey. Tomorrow on NJTV News, should the statute of limitations on sexual assault be amended? And we know what's proposed in next year's budget, but NJ Spotlight spotted some changes to this year's budget numbers. If you want their daily newsletter delivered to your inbox each morning, sign up on their website. To share any story you've seen tonight, go to njtvnews.org. I'm Mary Alice Williams. For all the men and women of NJTV News, thank you for being here. We'll see you tomorrow. RWJ Barnabas Health. Let's be healthy together. NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of residents and businesses for more than 100 years. And Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. PSE&G is building New Jersey's clean energy future. We're working to protect our network against extreme weather, expanding and upgrading transmission lines, and modernizing our natural gas system by installing new, more durable underground pipes. At PSE&G, our goal is to make sure you have the safe, reliable energy you need to power your life now and into the future. For over 85 years, in every county across the state, we've protected the health of New Jersey, covering families and businesses through life's big moments and the small ones. Because we don't just work here, we live here too. Over 5,000 local employees, all with the same purpose, taking care of you.